story we read in Luke chapter 24 this evening is where you would want to have your Bible open. It is most probably the most familiar of all the resurrection narratives that we read at Easter time. Malcolm Muggeridge called it one of the greatest pieces of English literature in his view. And it's probably just that sort of familiarity that makes it difficult for us sometimes really to grasp what it is that this incident we call the Emmaus Road is teaching us. Because it is indeed a very remarkable incident. And it gives us insight into something that we regularly affirm at Easter time, that one of the implications of Easter is that Jesus Christ is now alive, that we experience his risen presence as we worship together. As I remember Sinclair Ferguson saying to us one Sunday, he actually leads our worship now. He is the chief servant of God in the midst of his people. He is the chief pastor of the flock. It is he who works in our midst by his Holy Spirit. And we may learn from passages like this what the risen living Christ does when he comes amongst us and moves amongst us and ministers to us and speaks to us as we gather together. You will notice that there are at the very least two central truths in this passage which these two people, we only assume that they were two men. They may well have been a man and a woman. But the two central truths that they needed so much to learn are set down here clearly for us. They were confused and disappointed and doubting. They were people who were hurting deeply in almost every area of their lives. And Jesus began to minister to them. And you will notice the two areas on which he concentrates. And I want us to concentrate on them in these moments this evening. First, the centrality of Scripture for true Christian living. And secondly, the centrality of Christ for true Christian salvation. And these are the two things that I want us to focus our attention upon this evening because they are clearly the things that the Christ of the Emmaus Road on this Lord's Day evening brought before these men. First of all, the centrality of Scripture for true Christian living and for true Christian thinking and for true Christian understanding. As these two men walked on the seven-mile road from Jerusalem to Emmaus on this Sunday, they were in various kinds of need, you would see as we read the narrative. They were certainly in emotional need, which was most apparent when Jesus stops them and speaks with them, they are appearing disconsolate or sad. And of course, because they had just come from the funeral 
of their dearest friend. They were in a state of emotional rawness. They were also in psychological need because they were undoubtedly depressed and dejected and disappointed. They had a great sense of being baffled by events and being cast down into the depths by disappointment. They had intellectual needs as well because they were confused and puzzled and doubtful. At one point they thought that they understood exactly what Jesus Christ was going to do in the whole of the ancient world. They thought they knew precisely what the outcome of his mission would be. They thought they understood the sort of things he would do in them. Now they found it impossible to square what had happened with what they had believed and expected. And their needs were manifold, emotional, psychological, intellectual, probably above all spiritual, because this was a crisis of faith for these people. As they walked along this road, they were men who once had known what it was to have a great sense of elation in the presence of Jesus. There was clearly something about his presence and leadership that drew people out after him and sent their souls soaring with a sense of conviction and assurance and joy. And now the whole of their hope appears to have been disappointed. And the thing that's so significant is that for all of these needs, do you notice there is but one instrument that Jesus employs in order that he might minister to them? And that is in verse 32 as they reflect on precisely what he did and what happened to them on the road to Emmaus, they asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the Scriptures to us? Now in verse 27 we read precisely how he did this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And when he came in the latter part of the chapter after he had entered their home and then left, and they began to be alarmed at the presence of Jesus when he returned. In verse 44, he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scriptures. Now, do you notice how Jesus almost appears to become obsessive with this one instrument that he employs for the benefit and transformation of his children? Whatever their need may be, at whatever stage he finds them, in whatever condition, he takes the Scripture and he opens it up to them and he applies it to their minds and to their souls. And this is the great physician's only medicine. Now this is the risen Christ, my dear friends. 
This is the same Jesus who is here amongst us this evening. It is our boast and our joy that it is no other Jesus than this Jesus in all his exalted glory who is here by the Holy Spirit. And when we ask of him, what will you do with us this evening, Master? Here we come with all manner of needs, emotional, intellectual, psychological, spiritual He comes to us, and what you discover the Lord Jesus doing symbolically is taking Holy Scripture and saying, gather round. For he has no other ministry amongst his people than that. Notice how he rebukes them, these men, as he becomes very straightforward with them. In verse 25, when they have poured out their story to him, they say, we are talking to you about Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Then they tell him the story of the crucifixion and how their disappointed hopes lie in a thousand pieces around them. And Jesus says to them, how Foolish you are. Now it's possible that the authorized version translation, O fools, is a little bit strong. What Jesus is really saying is, How dull you are. It's the kind of thing that a teacher would say to a pupil Have you not learned your lessons? Have you not done your homework? How foolish you are. And what is their folly? Their folly is that they have neglected the truth of Holy Scripture. That's their folly. That's the root of so much of their difficulty. And the implication of Jesus' ministry as the risen Christ amongst his people is this, that there is no foolishness like the foolishness of neglecting the written word of God, especially when you have the opportunity to read and study and apply it to your own soul. Some think there is a hint here of dullness of mind which is surprising because of the time that they have had in terms of opportunity. I'm not at all sure about that, but it's certainly a truth whether it is contained here or not. What Jesus is saying, you see, to them by implication is how foolish you are. He would not have said that to people who had no opportunity to study the Word of God, to learn the truth of God from Holy Scripture. That would not have been folly. That would have been a misfortune. But when you have the opportunity, and when you have had it for three years in close association with the incarnate Christ as their expositor and teacher, How foolish, how foolish not to know it. Now let's pause for a moment. How many years have you had that kind of opportunity, my dear friends? How long have you had that opportunity opened before you in the mercy of God? Have you been wise with it? That's the question this Easter Sunday evening. Have you been wise with it? Or have you been foolish in relation to it? But you notice how he rebukes them for their sluggishness of heart, secondly. Secondly. 
he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow or sluggish of heart. Now, that kind of sluggishness is a response, of course, to the Word of God. Sluggishness is a combination of two things in this particular context and sense. It is a combination of stubbornness like the mule which will not move and laziness like the sluggard who will not work. That's what sluggishness is. It is a spirit that is stubborn and bound in self-will and will not move at the bidding of God. So this is not just a case, do you notice, of not knowing the Word of God. It is not responding to it rightly. And Jesus said to them, What have you been doing all this time as I opened the Word of God to you? Oh, says the psalmist, Be not stubborn like the mule. That's this condition. Sluggishness of heart. You know the kind of person who has to be dragged to do something. It's so difficult, isn't it, if you're a parent, you'll understand this. If you have a child who has to be dragged to do things, and you say how nice it must be to have children who are eager, willing to do precisely what you ask them. You know the sort of thing. Well, maybe I've never had the problem myself, but I'm sure some of you may not. And God has that problem. The Lord Jesus Christ says He is burdened by that characteristic in the lives of these men of Emmaus. How sluggish you are. My dear friends, here we are on this Easter Sunday evening, and what we are doing is celebrating the glorious reality of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are celebrating the enormity of the love of God for us in Jesus Christ, pledged in Calvary's blood. We are here amazed, if we are Christian people at all, at the vast wonder of God's mercy to us in Jesus. Should we not be amongst the people who run to do His will? who eagerly listen to His voice in order that we might embrace it and do it. And He says, how sluggish you have been. But there is a third thing Jesus rebukes them for, do you notice? And it is a lack of faith in the whole of Scripture. Just do get hold of this because it's really important. He rebukes them for their foolishness with the opportunity that they have had, with their sluggishness of heart and will in relation to the teaching and truth of Holy Scripture, and with the lack of faith that they have had in the whole of Scripture. Notice how foolish you are and how sluggish of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You see, Jesus' quarrel is not simply that they had a lack of knowledge of Scripture or a slowness to obey it. It was that in their general attitude to its entirety, they did not believe it all. Now, you see, that sounds a little bit like splitting hairs to me. Well, let me tell you that it is my experience over many years of ministry and Christian service that there are few things in Christian living so important 
and few things in serving God so central as this issue on which Jesus here puts his finger. It is the question of their confident trust in the entirety of Holy Scripture. The attitude of most professing Christians could be put into one of two categories in relation to the Bible. One, a selective acceptance of some of Scripture. That's one attitude. It is not that we dismiss Scripture altogether. It is that we have a selective acceptance of some of Scripture. It is really one of the most extraordinary positions to adopt, you know, because what it actually does is to put you above God. Where you are saying, well, God has written this, but I elect to dismiss that and choose this. And there is no question that what you are doing is deifying your own will and your own intellect. But there are people who do that. There are people who do not do it intellectually and theoretically, but do it practically and daily in their behavior. That is, now is it not so easy for us to live this way? What we do is, we say theoretically, Oh yes, I stand on the ground of the whole of the Word of God inspired from cover to cover and the covers too. I believe the Bible all the way through. I stand on this authority. And then in our daily behavior, in terms of our daily obedience to the Word of God, we become selective. Ah, but we say, now I quote, nobody takes that seriously nowadays. Nobody lives like that nowadays. So I don't live like that nowadays. What am I doing? I'm being selective in my obedience to the Word of God. Listen to Jesus and remember that faith and obedience belong together. How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now, there is no doubt when you take these two attitudes, a selective acceptance of some of Scripture and an absolute acceptance of all of Scripture, there is no doubt which is Jesus' attitude. Both in his intellectual subscription and in his moral obedience, not one jot or tittle of the law shall pass away until it is all fulfilled, he says. And in terms of his daily obedience, he says unselfconsciously, I do always that which is pleasing to my Father. Now, if that is Jesus' attitude, my dear friends, on this Easter Sunday evening when we are talking about the ministry of the risen Christ in our lives and in our midst, we need to ask, which is my attitude to Holy Scripture? Is it the same as Jesus? Or is it different? I say again to you, it has been my experience that nothing makes a greater difference to Christian life and service for God than the clarification, the absolute clarification of this issue. Now, as Jesus ministers to these men's great need, his confidence is in the exposition and application of Scripture to their situation. And you notice that that not only affected their minds, 
and their psychological condition and their spiritual condition. It affected their emotional life as well. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? And that is the reality even today. As John Wesley would gladly have testified as he went into that little chapel in Alders Great Gate Street in the 18th century and found a man dully reading the commentary that he had in his hand on the Epistle to the Romans. And he said, I did feel my heart strangely warmed within me while he read. Now here is the one place that Jesus therefore concentrates upon, and we need to ask ourselves the corresponding questions about whether this is where our confidence lies for our own lives. Those of us, and there are some of us here this evening who are in the ministry, we need to ask, where does our confidence lie? in the ministry and service God has given to us. Does it lie in our own gifts? Then God help us. Does it lie in some kind of scheming, planning, administrative labor that we may engage in? Does it lie in gimmicks and novelty and whatsoever? Then I say again, God help us in His mercy. Because our only confidence, if we are to see the risen Jesus at work in our midst, is in the Word of God. The centrality of Scripture for true Christian living. Let me turn with you secondly to the centrality of Christ for true Christian living. Salvation. Of course, that is linked as closely as it could be with the first of these two themes. For the central theme of Scripture, which gives the Scripture its unity, is Christ. And so when he expounded the Scriptures in verse 27... He began with Moses and all the prophets and explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That is, he expounded scripture with Christ as the central theme. And I say again to you, that was not an isolated moment. The very next time that they meet him, he does exactly the same thing, so that we read in verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. And he began to expound the truth about himself to them. I wonder if you can imagine what he would say to them. He began with Moses, and I think that right back into the book of Genesis, Jesus would point them to that seed of the woman who was promised to come as early as Genesis 3. And he would say, I am the seed of the woman, promised even in the moment of man's first failure. He would then take him on to Abraham to the promise that God gave to Abraham, and he would say, I am the fulfillment of that covenant promise that God made to Abraham at the beginning. When he took them on into the book of Exodus, he would show them the Passover lamb 
that was slain and its blood applied on the pillars and the doorposts. And he would say, I am the fulfillment of that Passover lamb. He would take them on into the book of Leviticus and he would show them the sacrifices and that intricate sacrificial system of blood sacrifice to take away sin. And he would say, I am the fulfillment of all of these sacrifices. I am the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. I am the scapegoat cast out into the wilderness bearing the people's sin. He would take them on into the book of Numbers and say to them, I am the rock that was smitten so that multitudes might have their thirst slaked and be satisfied. And so he would go on through the Scriptures tracing how Christ in all the Scriptures is its central and fundamental theme. He would take them to Isaiah and say, Here in the suffering servant is the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. He would take them through all the Psalms and show them how the Psalms speak of Him. What is it that you heard me cry on Calvary? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The psalmist in Psalm 22 sang of that. And he opens up the Scriptures to them. And wherever you go in the Bible, Jesus finds himself. Now the point about that is not simply that the central theme of Scripture is Jesus. It is that the central figure in salvation is Jesus Christ. And this is what he is proclaiming to these men on the Emmaus Road and to this company of people on the first Easter Sunday in the evening. Startled and frightened, he says to them, look at my hands, look at my, my feet. And he reveals himself to them. Now the point about that, you see, is that salvation is found not in a piece of doctrine, but in Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and exalted. And we grow in grace as Christian people, not through some technique that we may use, but by knowing Christ. It is Jesus who is the central figure of the whole of Scripture because He is the central person in our salvation. And that centrality, of course, is intended by Him to become more than just a mental preoccupation. It is intended to become what Paul calls a preeminence in our lives. I live, says Paul, yet not I. It is Christ who lives in me. And my friends, you could tell it. You could tell it. I am bound to ask it of myself. I guess you will feel you need to ask of yourself. Can you tell it? Can you tell it in a life like mine? Can you tell it in a life like yours? Preoccupied with Christ. What is it someone said in some people's lives? Jesus Christ has a place. In many people's lives, Jesus Christ has a prominent place. But there are some people's lives in whom Jesus Christ has a preeminent place. And that's what really matters. 
Do you notice that towards the end of this passage, and I leave this with you as we close, towards the end of this passage there are three occasions when Jesus is said to open something to the disciples. In verse 31, he opens their eyes and they see him. In verse 32, they say he opened the scriptures and they saw him there. And in order that they might understand what they were reading and see the Christ of Scripture, in verse 45 we read, Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scripture. He will do anything really to get us to the Scriptures and to get us to Christ. Before I finish, let me say to you, there may be some of us here in this building this evening who have never yet got to Christ. We may have got to church. We may have got to the Bible. I thank God for the second even more than for the first. But I want to say to you that the thing that matters above all others is getting to Christ. For he is the one in whom salvation in all its glory is found. And the place to find him is here. May God make us men and women of the book, one book, and men and women of Christ, preeminent. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in your risen power, we believe that you are here in the midst of your people. We humbly beg you this evening that you would so meet with us on this particular stretch of life's road, whatever our need and condition may be, and grant that as you draw us to yourself, through your holy word, we may hear your voice and with glad and willing heart embrace the Savior. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen.